My name is Philip Marshall, I'm the director of the London Library, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening to hear Bennett Brandreth talk to us about rhetoric, the art of persuasion. The library's founder, Thomas Carlyle, um, had this to say about, uh, about tonight's subject. Not brute force, but only persuasion and faith are the kings of this world. So I think he would have definitely approved of tonight's talk, and it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Bennett to you. Bennett Brandreth, QC, has studied and practiced rhetoric for 20 years. In that time, he's twice won the World Public Speaking Championships. He's been awarded the Richard Ducan Memorial Prize for Excellence in Advocacy, and in 2018 was appointed Queen's Council, as you know, awarded for Excellence in Advocacy. Bennett is also an award-winning comedian, a critically acclaimed novelist, uh, the rhetoric coach for the Royal Shakespeare Company as well, uh, an advocacy trainer for Middle Temple. Bennett's new book on rhetoric in Shakespeare is coming out in October, so you're going to get some sneak previews of that and look out for that when it does come out. Um, and, and Bennett will be happy to take questions at the end of his presentation, but if I could just ask as a matter of housekeeping if you could use the roving mics, we've got two of these going around the room, um, so that everyone can, can hear the question, uh, and also because we're filming tonight and it will be picked up then on the film. <laughs> and finally, we have some copies of Bennett's novels about Shakespeare and his, uh, his adventures in Italy, imagined adventures in Italy, uh, which are on sale this evening, and Bennett will be delighted to sign downstairs in the issue hall after the event, if, you'd, uh, if you can persuade him to. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, give you Bennett Brandreth. My friends, what a delight it is to be here amongst what the organisers assure me are the intellectual elite of the London literary scene. And uh, therefore, I think we can assume the world. Uh, but looking out amongst you and seeing the beautiful and intelligent people before me, some of you both at the same time, I see that those assurances were well deserved. I hope uh, that I shall treat you well over the course of the next hour uh, to a discussion of rhetoric. Uh, and uh, it may have struck you, as you heard uh, the beloved director explaining the various things that I do, uh, that here was a man who simply couldn't concentrate on one thing for any uh, length of time at all. But there is, in truth, at least I, I like to think, a common thread that runs through my various endeavours. And that is a love of language and a fascination with the power of language, how words work. And that uh, fascination has led me to uh, a deep and abiding interest in classical rhetoric, which is the subject of my talk tonight. And like all the best talks, and indeed as I was specifically asked to do by uh, the people who have organised it, I shall make this talk entirely interactive. Yes, my friends, it's far too late for you now to leave, having realised that that's what I'm going to do. But yes, you will be required to participate, to be actively involved in the process of the discussion tonight. And I begin that interactive process by asking, does anyone know what is rhetoric? It's not a rhetorical question, people. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely looking to find out if people have an answer. Any thoughts? Oratory. Sorry, oratory? Yes, now that is a very common answer but it's not right. <laughs> oratory is an aspect of rhetoric, but rhetoric's compass is much, much broader than that. Rhetoric is concerned more generally with communication, with the power of words. Anybody else got a suggestion? Yes? The art of discussion to discover each other's truths. Oh, I love that. I'm gonna steal that and not attribute it to you later on. It's not quite what I was looking for, though. At least it's not the classical rhetorical definition of rhetoric, which is that it is the art of persuasion. The art of persuasion. So kind of my mother to come to the talk tonight. <laughs> She's heard it before, but don't worry. I should be so lucky to have a mother like you. Uh, we'll talk about that later on. Anyhow, yes, classical rhetoric, the art of persuasion. It is the study of how we can use words to move the minds of others. And you can see immediately, therefore, that what it is concerned with is a study that stands at the intersection of a number of other thoughts, poetry, psychology, philosophy, logic, and argument. And it is, for that reason, particularly fascinating. For me, also fascinating, because it is a study of such a long history. 
It begins in uh, the 5th century before Christ with uh, manuals that were created for litigants who were trying to reclaim property stolen by the tyrant of Syracuse. And then it develops through uh, Athens onto Rome and Cicero and the, the great forum uh, and the legal cases there, all the way onwards through the medieval period, where it was the subject of uh, sermons and letter writing manuals up to Elizabethan times, when it became, uh, again, a focus of uh, education with the humanist uh, movement in uh, education that uh, swept through Europe, people like Erasmus uh, leading the charge. And for me, that's a particular fascination because I have a great love for the works of Shakespeare. And very few people realise that the young William Shakespeare, as a grammar school student in Stratford, would, for the entirety of his education, have had as the sum and substance of that education the study of rhetoric. And in that way, it was for him the lens through which he understood how words worked and the power of language. And therefore, as a tool for understanding Shakespeare, for approaching those texts both critically and in performance, a fascinating insight. Now, rhetoric, traditionally, is divided into five canons, five uh, parts of study. Invention, disposition, memory, style, and utterance. So invention is that part of rhetoric where you're coming up with arguments, developing ideas and uh, frameworks for what you're going to discuss. Disposition. That's the guidance that rhetoric offers to how to organise those ideas so that they may be presented at their most persuasive. Then we have memory. Now memory at its most base level is remembering what it is you're going to say problem that you'll discover I have repeatedly through the next uh, hour of our talk. But that's perhaps the least interesting aspect of memory as rhetoric understands it. Much more fascinating is the guidance, the, the instruction that classical rhetoric gives us to build a stock of knowledge of facts, but also of fables, of anecdotes, of uh, wise sayings, maxims that we can deploy readily in arguments so that we may uh, address matters spontaneously, giving us, in a strange way, a sort of ability to operate at two levels at the same time. Quintilian says the great power of memory is that by having possession and mastery of it, we should be able to, at the same time, be speaking that which we had intended to speak, and yet thinking about the next thing we want to discuss, thinking about how we will counter the arguments of others. And having that power of memory is what gives us that magical ability. After memory, we have style, elocutio. Now, that is the discussion of rhetorical figures and tropes. It's what many people now think of when they think of rhetoric, the organisation of the words itself. And what is fascinating about classical rhetoric is that it gives us an understanding of language, of words, that is not simply about the gilding of the lily, about making words more beautiful, more interesting, more fascinating, but also about how we can use words, structure words, to convey emotional states in the speaker and to create emotional states in the people that we're speaking to. And so that is the study of style. And finally, we have performance, the bit where you stand up the oratory and deliver what it is that you have to say. Uh, this is the acting part of the study of rhetoric, which is referred to in the Greek in a word I've always thought was rather good to apply to acting, hypocrisis. <laughs> uh, now, in fact, interestingly enough, the rhetorical manuals uh, don't really delve into the details of the performative aspects of rhetoric. Uh, when they do provide advice, Quintilian in the Institutes of Oratory, uh, a kind of a guidebook for uh, rhetors, for teachers of rhetoric, uh, trots over it very lightly, but his advice would be familiar to any voice coach of the modern era. When you want to project your voice, when you want to be loud, don't speak from the throat, speak from the belly. Yeah? If you want to be heard, open up your mouth, look forward when you do it. And for me, most fascinating of all, he also says at one point, there may be certain points in your speech where it would be helpful to convey how deeply passionate you feel about the subject you're discussing. And it may at that point, <clears throat> be helpful if a tear could come to your eye just to convey that you too are moved so that the person you're speaking to is moved. But that may be difficult if you don't actually feel that upset about it. <laughs> so Quintilian suggests that at that point you try to recall some sad event of your own past, perhaps 
the death of a dog that you loved greatly as a child. And he says, at that point, you will find very readily the tears come to you. And so we discover that 2,000 years ago, Quintilian was teaching the Stanislavski method. <laughs> so yes, 2,000 years of history, five massive topics for discussion within the study of rhetoric, and now a little less than an hour to do it in. <laughs> My friends, I am good, but I'm not that good. I'm going to, if I may, focus my discussion on uh, two aspects of rhetoric in particular, on invention and on uh, style. Those two, interestingly enough, considered to be the most important aspects of rhetoric by the classical authors. And even in focusing on them, I'm going to miss, I'm afraid, huge swathes of what rhetoric has to offer us in the understanding of language. My aim is really to do, well, I guess, a couple of things. The first is to show you how rhetoric gives us a tool for understanding communication, understanding the power of uh, language that goes beyond simply considering which word I should use or what the meaning of that word is, to begin to, to pull apart and pull up away the, the flesh, the muscles, to get right, right down to the bones of how we persuade, of how words work on other people. And if I manage to show you that that is something available to you, then I hope you will immediately decide that you should buy my book on rhetoric when it comes out, uh, or indeed uh, any of the other books that are available, though they're obviously much less good. Uh, that is one aim. Uh, th the other aim is, is perhaps, if I may, to give you a couple of tools that I have found very useful from within rhetoric that I think are of general applicability when it comes to the use of language and communication in a number of different environments. And again, I, I hope that if you find them useful and interesting, you will take them away because you will want to go and find out more uh, about rhetoric. Now, in saying all of that, my expectation is not to tell you anything new. Indeed, I would be, in a way, slightly disappointed if I did. After all, this is a study of over two and a half thousand years in length. One of the things I think is interesting about rhetoric is that we can, when discussing it, still use Greek and Latin terms because we discover that although technology has changed, although we can now reach into our pocket and order a pizza from Azerbaijan and have it delivered by Uber Air, <laughs> fundamentally, people have not changed as much as we think they have done. And that actually the same patterns of thought, the same patterns of language that worked on the ancient Greeks and on the ancient Romans also work on us today. And that sense of connection that sense also of the awareness that we are repeating old patterns. I, I promised I wouldn't discuss Brexit. Uh, old patterns again and again, I think, is part of the fascination of the study of rhetoric. So those are my overarching goals. If you have any questions at the end that don't cover those, let's see if we get to them. Let me, therefore, begin with that first task and your first interactive element. Tell me, my friends, consider this. What is the difference between a conversation and what I'm doing now. There are two people at least in a conversation. There are two people at least in a conversation. That is true, although there are two people at least in this kind of communication as well. But, uh, they're normally not talking to you. Ah, ah, so what you're saying is that in a conversation, there are at least two participants, yes, at some level or other. I would agree, I would agree. There, there's a, there's a, a fundamental difference. Uh, in that respect, a conversation has automatically got to have at least two people in it. Would everyone agree with that? Now, what, what follows from that? That's the interesting question. Yes? Um, dialectics. Go on. That you learn from conversation with yes. someone else. OK. So, so... so slightly hurtful. I'm hoping you're learning from my talk now. <laughs> um, so, for instance, Socrates... Yes, says, uh, right. Uh, that you never read. Yes. You learn by conversation. You're on to something. You're on something. Why is it that a conversation facilitates learning in that way? Because it includes questions. Uh, go on. Yes, exactly. There's a, there's a kind of expectation, isn't there, that the participants in the conversation will uh, clarify. Yeah? If, if I say something uh, remarkable, and for a brief moment you take your eyes off my magnificent hair, remarkable in a man of 44, uh, is uh, you, you think, actually, what was he talking about just then? I, I, I need some clarification. In the conversation... It's possible to do that, yeah? Indeed, it's almost expected. In fact, it's one of the remarkable things about a conversation, isn't it? So great is the expectation that both sides will participate in it, that it only takes a pause, a silence of about half a second to become an awkward silence in a conversation, doesn't it? And indeed, we, we are so conscious of that 
that when we're speaking in a conversation, knowing that the other person might well try to interrupt, we fill those awkward silences with ums and errs, as if to say, I still have the conch shell. <laughs> Whereas here, I've just managed to pause for really quite a long time without anybody feeling, oh my God, I must say something before it becomes too embarrassing for him. Because there isn't that expectation. There isn't that sense of two-way communication. And as a result, there isn't, as you say, as you point out, that inbuilt opportunity for clarification and for review. What did you mean by that? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that. Just go back over that. Now, the consequence of that is that this kind of communication, and when I'm speaking to you in this forum, you are collectively dumber <laughs> than you would be if I was speaking to you one-on-one. -on -one. This is Socrates' point. Because there isn't that built-in uh, aspect. Now, what, what, I, what I draw to your attention there is that is nothing to do with the subject of my discussion. It is irrelevant what I'm talking about. That is something about the mode of communication, yes? And uh, therefore, we have to be thinking not just about what we're discussing, how we want to say it. We have to be thinking when we're communicating about the qualities, the circumstances in which we are doing it. And we have to adapt to that. So, for example, in this kind of piece of oratory as opposed to a conversation, knowing that there are no opportunities for feedback and review, I can try and compensate for that. First of all, I can keep repeating or summarizing where it is that I've been and where it is that I intend to go. A and at the same time, I can artificially stop halfway through and go, is everybody clear on what I'm saying? So that if I'm worried that people are getting lost, uh, there's a chance for me to correct course early on. But I have to do that consciously because it isn't available to me in the context of the communication. By the way, you know that we're all being uh, filmed tonight, which is why I'm standing this way so that it gets my best side. <laughs> Please feel free to live tweet proceedings. Uh, long gone are the days when looking at someone uh, staring at their phone while you were talking was a bad sign. Now I just assume you're updating your, your Instagram followers on the latest uh, movement in rhetoric. Uh, but please use the hashtag sexy beast. Um, yes, I, I digress. So um, we see already that there is something different, fundamentally different between a conversation and uh, a speech. And that I have to acknowledge that irrespective of the way that I'm talking. And these are the kinds of insights that we look to for rhetoric. We look to find in rhetoric an understanding of communication that um, uh, goes deeper than the words themselves. Now, uh, once we've uh, started to, to look at it in that way, all manner of insights come out. Let us turn from that then to the question of invention. Now, as I said, invention is when we're kind, trying to come up with ideas, trying to develop uh, thoughts and things that we uh, can offer to the people that we're speaking with. And the, the heart, the focus of rhetoric is, as you uh, pointed out, on persuasion. So can I ask you, if I may, always reassuring when they come back. I never like to point out when they go away, but when they come back, oof, what a relief. Um, can I ask you, can you just draw in your own minds to some ideas, some thoughts of occasions when you yourselves have been persuaded? Some of you out there going, never, never happens. I'm like stone, once I've fixed my mind, <laughs> straightforward. Any, any thoughts, any occasions where you've been persuaded? Well, look at that, there was almost a loving couple there, as if to say, well, <laughs> is it too soon to talk of the engagement? Um, <laughs> it is. Uh, any ideas, any thoughts? Have you ever been persuaded? Any of you? Stunned silence. Food. Ah, yes, go on. Food. Food? Yes. Food persuades you. <laughs> eating, eating something, being, um, getting the message to eat at a certain place. Okay, yes. So that's an occasion when you've been persuaded. What was it that persuaded you to eat at that particular place? You don't even know. Just Smells. the smell, okay. All right. Um, anything else? Visuals, smells. Uh, okay. What sort of visuals? Tempting. 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 What kind of temptation? I'm going to get there in the end, people. <laughs> what, did they, what images did they show you? Visions of the future. A happy man, delicious food in front of him, the smells rising up. Yeah, there was a kind of picture, perhaps, of your future. Yeah? Okay. 
All right, I like that. That's an interesting idea. A kind of image of where you might be, the future you. Yes, good, good. Are you offering me something? I don't know if I'm too late. No. But uh, the principal difference between conversation yes. and what you're doing yes. is that you are conveying a huge amount of emotion. Ah. And in conversation, that's extremely rare. Oh, well, you haven't had a conversation with me, I've got to tell you that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. See, I, I, I think that's interesting. See, a lot of, uh, I get a lot of these sorts of answers. And actually, when you drill down into it, that is a, a difference about particular instances of communication that you've experienced. It's not about the mode of communication. And I think the point I was trying to make earlier is that there is something that's structural about the difference between a conversation and a piece of oratory that has to be acknowledged and, and compensated for, that isn't necessarily about the person speaking and the level of emotion that they give. Although, thank you for saying I'm very emotional. I'm very sweet of you. My, my wife says I'm too uptight, so it's, I shall cite you in uh, counter-evidence. But I'm asking you for things that have persuaded you in the past. Advertising. Yes. Oh, oh, hang on, advertising. I'll come to you in a second. Go on, tell me more about the advertising. What kind of advertising was it? Uh, this morning, I saw an advert on a high-end car that admitted only water. OK, all right, why? So you received a piece of information. Yes. OK, and the information was relevant to you because you cared about the environment. Yes. OK, all right, so a piece of information was provided to you that you hadn't previously had. Anybody else? Yes, sorry, you were about to give me something. Well, at work, a lot of bosses tried me to do something that was really boring. Yes. <laughs> and I resisted for years and years and years. <laughs> and then another boss came along yes. said, with a smile. Yes. This is really important. Yes. If you don't do it, I'll do it. OK. OK. And suddenly I was persuaded. All right. So first of all, you were, you were given a kind of broader understanding of why it mattered. No. no. Why? The fact that you had a personal impact on her. On her. Oh, right. OK. And, and that you, and you liked her and you didn't want her to suffer. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> is she in the audience tonight? Yes. <laughs> also, Commanded. Ah, you weren't being commanded. So it, it appealed to your sense of your status in relation to her? I suppose so. My sense of fair play. Ah, excellent. Okay, very good. Interesting. Yes. Anything else? Yes. Sorry. Come back. Being persuaded to give, give money yes. to a complete stranger whom one doesn't like. Yes. And um, knows is a swindling love. <laughs> <laughs> He's sitting in the front row about two along if you want to ask him for anything at the end of the night. What, what, but what persuaded you to do that? Well, I'm hoping you're going to turn it because I do it repeatedly and I loathe myself and I really loathe them. But why do you give it to them in the first place? Out of a concern that you might, they might be telling the truth on that one occasion? No, I'm absolutely certain they're lying. Out of a, des but out of a desire to make yourself feel better? No, I thought possibly out of self-hatred. Out of self-hatred. It was very clearly billed as a rhetoric session, my friend, not a psychology <laughs> session. But, but I, I am available, and we will talk about that at my hourly rate after uh, tonight's show. Um, but we will talk about that as well. What, there was a, yes, a suggestion at the back. I was going to say something, um, someone says something to you, you disagree with, but you trust them and you respect them. Ah, and you, okay. you go like, oh, well, if you think that, yes. maybe it might be true. Right, OK, yes, absolutely, absolutely. I, I recognise that. Anything else? You about facts, facts, boy. Boring, so. like like the water from the engine, sort of information. Yeah, exactly. Raw facts. Should Bolivia have a navy? It's a landlocked country. <laughs> Those are relevant facts. You say yes. Okay. Anything else? Yes. It's very similar to that, I suppose. Kind of cold logic. Cold, ruthless logic. Yes. Now the men are speaking. Facts, <laughs> logic. Do not touch me with your emotions. <laughs> Anything else? No. Okay. Well, look. What is, I think is interesting from this is that we've had a number of different things, some of them, frankly, a little bit disturbing, <laughs> that have come out. But what, what we've seen is that a number of different things proved to be persuasive, from uh, our friends here, for whom it's nothing but facts and logic, uh, to the person who wanted to feel that their uh, status was being respected, but also felt a certain empathy for the person who was asking them something, to the man who was simply digging deep into a well of personal hatred uh, and, and kind of flagellating himself as he handed the money over. Again, second row, uh, second person in, if you want to, to ask him for anything at the end. Nothing, nothing too weird. Um, now, 
the reason I, I bring all of this up is that, there, that although there are a number of different occasions on which we are persuaded and a number of different ways in which we prove to be persuaded, we can classify all of those different kinds of persuasion using a division that Aristotle presented to us in the art of rhetoric, the modes of persuasion. Ethos, pathos, and logos. Now, ethos is uh, the argument from authority, from the status of the speaker. It's the sort of thing, in uh, a sense, that you were aiming at, and in a strange way also, I suspect, something uh, that lay behind uh, your point about giving uh, money to the people who were swindling you. Then we have uh, logos, uh, the facts, the uh, water from the pipe, the, the ruthless uh, logic. It's the argument from reason, from uh, logic, dialectic, from, from uh, facts themselves. And then we have pathos. Pathos is the argument from emotion, from the, uh, the suffering of the speaker or the person that you're trying uh, to engage with. Now, ethos, pathos and logos, they are a kind of mental model. You can see immediately that by presenting them, I am presenting something deeply simplified compared to the actual instances on which uh, there have been uh, in, uh, persuasion happening. And uh, therefore, something has been lost in doing so, inevitably. Some nuance has disappeared. And yet, at the same time, something has been gained. Because by simplifying our thinking about persuasion into these three modes of persuasion, we make it easier for us to grip onto them, to manipulate them, to understand them. In the same way that a map is not the territory across which you walk, but does give you a way of getting from A to B and to understand how to get from A to B. So I suggest that the modes of persuasion prove to be a very useful tool for discussing how we persuade, for identifying and analysing arguments. So, for example, I am uh, in my day job an intellectual property silk and I'm standing in, in front of a judge trying to persuade uh, that judge of the merits of my client's case. Do I lead with ethos, pathos or logos? Logos. Anybody? Somebody's going with pathos. Oh, bold, bold. Who, who's hands up for logos? Yeah, hands up for pathos. Oh, OK. I think, I think the majority was with Logos. And I, I suspect um, that I would lead with Logos. Why would I lead with Logos? Logos is a judge. Because, or indeed she is, indeed. Uh, go on, is somebody saying something in the back? Judges are emotionless. Judges are emotionless, <laughs> not the judges that I know. But, but they are constrained. They have to, at some point, produce a written judgment. They have to explain the reasons why they came to the conclusion that they came to. And they can't simply say, my God, he's so beautiful and he dresses so wonderfully. I know they want to, but they can't say just that. They have to provide some uh, reasons. Their situation constrains them. Now, you rightly suggest that I'm not going to ignore ethos and pathos if I'm trying to persuade the judge that actually my interpretation of this particular authority is the one to be trusted, then I might draw upon the fact that I've written a, a practitioner textbook that discusses this very issue and uh, therefore uh, can be trusted when I say, oh look, I really know what I'm talking about here. And I'm certainly not going to ignore pathos, as you suggest, because ultimately I've also got to tell the judge this is why it matters that you agree with my reasons. My client has concerns that need to be addressed. So I'm not going to ignore them, but I'm definitely going to focus on Logos. And the reason I'm going to do that is about the judge. Now, a different scenario. You've paid a vast amount of money, I assume, to come here tonight, and you've discovered that it isn't quite the talk you were after, and worse yet, there's audience interaction. And so furious, you rise as an angry mob and turn to charge upon the director of the London Library, <laughs> intending to rend him limb from bloody limb. At that point, I stand before you attempting to, to persuade you not to do this awful thing. Do I lead with a Logos? No. 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 OK, I think we're all agreed on that. Pathos, ethos? Pathos, pathos some people are saying. Some people might say ethos. I guess it, it might depend on uh, how I felt I stood in relation to you. Maybe if I was a, uh, this was a more of a religious scenario and I had some kind of uh, moral standing as a religious leader, I might try that. But probably in this scenario, pathos, think of him. Think of his children and how they will weep over his corpse, that sort of thing. Yeah, You are not such men and women as these, you know, etc., etc. So I would lead with pathos. Maybe I wouldn't ignore Logos. I'd probably say, you know, in a sense, what I'm doing is giving reasons why you would be sad. But I'm definitely leading with pathos. Why, on this occasion, pathos rather than Logos? 
You're talking to the many, not the one. Well, that's true. Susceptible to, lo to logic. The m angry mob is not susceptible to logic. Their heat is up, their anger, their dudgeon. Philip is quailing in the background, and you are ready, gnashing your teeth. Exactly so. So do we see that the choice of argument that I am wanting to make is not dictated by anything about me so much as it is dictated by something about the person I'm trying to speak to? about their concerns, about the constraints that they are under. Do, do we see that? Yeah? OK. Now, that seems to be a very important point, because a lot of communication, when it goes wrong, particularly persuasive communication, goes wrong because that fundamental truth has not been acknowledged. Yeah? Let's try a, Oh, yes, go for it. Yes. Well, I mean, there's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, which is uh, George Osborne saying yes. that the big failure of the uh, of the of the of the of the, uh, the campaign to remain yes was we failed to create an emotional connection right okay yes a failure of pathos yes although I, I think that the, the difficulty with that and again this is part of why an hour almost isn't enough is that that in itself tells you that they were thinking of the people to be persuaded in a homogenous way and that uh, part of what I'm trying to to illustrate to you is that as soon as you do that then you have to ask yourself why you're entitled to conclude that they can be treated in that way. Now, sometimes they might be able to do so. But if you can't do that, then you need to employ a technique called exargasia, which is where you use a number of different examples, a number of different arguments, because you want to hit different groups with different concerns. And we'll see a great master of rhetoric do that in the example sheet that I have, uh, where President Obama uh, does precisely that. But let me come back to that. Let me come back to that. I just want to try a very quick experiment. I think I've got time for it. M my friend, you, you obviously love your food, if I may say so. Not from the way you look, but from what you were telling me. Did you have a magnificent lunch today? Yes. Yes. W what did you have? Well, I had a sandwich. Sandwich, yep. Yes. <laughs> uh, with uh, delicious cheddar cheese. Good. Some... I'm going to stop you there. You had a cheese sandwich. <laughs> Thank you. Made by, your own fa made by your own fair hand? I just don't want to get ahead of myself. Very much so. Made by your own fair hand. I love that. OK. Do you know this lady here? No, I don't. Would you mind if I, would you mind if I draw upon you? Did you have a nice lunch today? Um, not particularly. OK. I'm moving on from you. Who did have a nice lunch today? You, you did. Excellent. Do you know this gentleman here? No. Good. Tell me, do you, what lunch did you have today? I had avocado on toast. Avocado. Avocado on toast with a poacher. Chili flakes? Uh, no, just. Um... Should try that next time. It's very good. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So two homemade lunches: avocado on toast with a poached egg, cheese sandwich. Now, just if I may ask you, just to think to yourselves, how you would persuade this other person you've not met before tomorrow to have the lunch that you had today? Yes. And just, I want thirty seconds, no more, from you doing that. Now, whilst they're just taking a moment to think about that. I wouldn't mind if, if you, the listeners, also thought about what you would be saying, how you would be persuading, choosing one or the other, the other person to say, uh, to have that lunch, and what, what sort of things you would say. And then, and then we'll just consider what, what we have, um, what we're being offered here. So uh, if I could just very quickly um, get you just really 30 seconds, no more, on, uh, would you mind going first? On the cheese sandwich. Perhaps I, would you mind standing up just to, just, just, to, just so that people can hear you? Yeah, so so you're, you. this lady here. So what, what's your name? My name is Sid. Sid? Yes. And what's this name? What's your name? Barbara. Sid and Barbara. Barbara. Excellent. It's like a sitcom. <laughs> uh, good. Right. So Sid, to Barbara, please. 30 seconds. Well, Barbara, I could start with the benefits of eating a cheese sandwich, but uh, that's certainly not how I want to pursue this argument. Um, what I would like to say is the delicacy of creating a cheese sandwich with your very own hands, adding some chutney to it, some mint chutney, which I did, and some tomatoes, yes. gives you a really delicious, incredible flavor, mm -hmm. which I don't know, once you have it, it's, it's very difficult to describe in words, but once you have it, <laughs> you will know exactly what I mean. Wonderful. Thank you, Sid. Magnificent. But Barbara, if you wouldn't mind persuading Sid, please, to have the avocado smash with a poached egg. If you, if you wouldn't mind, it's terribly cruel of me, but um, yeah. 
Well, I think the, what was so lovely about my lunch was the avocado was at perfect ripeness um, on lovely sourdough toast. And the egg, which I poached in my little, very little saucepan, so it came out perfectly uh, round and was very yellow on top of the gorgeous green. And it was just a lovely combination of textures and flavours. Marvellous. Thank you. I, I'm clearly am dealing with the intellectual elite. I'm delighted to report on it. Now, look, neither of you knew each other. I don't know either of you. I think I feel like Paul Daniels, and I, I don't know either of you. But so, but we just talked about how what's so important with these things is to, to persuade by reference to what we think the other person uh, uh, wants or needs. And so I'm just doing a little psychological analysis based on, on what... So Sid led with Barbara. Uh, he's going to talk about the benefits of eating, but then drew back because he thought, here's a woman who knows how to eat. Uh, uh, she needs no guidance. Uh, but then he quickly moved on to delicacy, the delicacy of the sandwich, because he looked at Barbara and he thought, that is a fussy, fussy eater. Picky. Wow, better emphasize the delicacy of the sandwich. Uh, bet she cuts the crusts off, the loony OCD woman. And then, um, and then you, you hem heavily emphasize the artisanal nature of the sandwich, the chutney, the flavors, because, again, looking at her, you immediately he thought, this is a woman sensual. She's all about the physical pleasures, the tastes, the, the chutney bursting on the tongue. You, you were, you, I'm afraid there was something, there was a frisson there that I thought was almost, <laughs> almost illegal. Interesting, interesting. Funnily enough, then, Barbara, uh, looking at you, um, immediately struck out at your OCD. She thought, here's a man who has colour matched his T-shirt to his jeans. This is a guy who cares about the perfect ripeness of the avocado. Um, uh, and, uh, but then went on, interestingly, to highlight how brilliant her own cookware was, because she knows <laughs> that you're the kind of guy that likes an excuse to buy new stuff, right? <laughs> buy new bits of kit. And then, uh, again, noting your brilliant colour coordination of top and bottom, she thought, the thing I'll finish with is the colour of the food. <laughs> Nothing to do with the taste, but whether it was yellow matched with green. <laughs> yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, what I'm doing there is uh, slightly facetiously trying to highlight that what actually happened, despite, I think, some attempts to think about what the other person was about, what actually happened is that the person merely set out the reasons why they had enjoyed their sandwich, yeah? Now, look, that's not a surprise. That's absolutely what everyone does. What's interesting about it is that we have done it literally minutes after I told you that's not good for persuasion. That's not what we want to do. And there's a reason for it. The reason for it is that actually thinking is extraordinarily hard to do, yeah? Thinking is a very tiresome and difficult activity. And uh, naturally, we therefore, we light upon the very first thing that we can think of as a good answer, and that is the answer that persuaded us. And we deploy it with the other person without necessarily giving enough regard to the specifics of what matters to the other person. Now, in the context of what shall we have for lunch tomorrow, actually, you're probably likely to hit some relevant factors almost by chance, because that really it's taste, ease of preparation, and you know, appearance. The first bite is with the eye. But on a more complex issue, that failure to move beyond the question of what had persuaded you can be absolutely fatal. When I'm coaching young barristers, the number one error that they make outside of a kind of you shouldn't ask a leading question scenario is that they get to an answer to why the court should find in their favour and they stop there. Instead of also considering what will the judge be worried about? What if he doesn't accept or she doesn't accept my first argument? How can I move my way around it? How can I show, for example, that if they don't like that, it doesn't matter because I've got another answer to it uh, instead? And so when that moment happens, because don't forget, the judge isn't concerned with why you're right. The judge is concerned with why you might be wrong because the judge doesn't want some bunch of gits on the Court of Appeal telling them that they were an idiot <laughs> because they're very sensitive creatures, those judges, and their egos are fragile, fragile, fragile. So y you can see you have to think about that sort of thing. And by thinking about it in terms of ethos, pathos and logos, we immediately start the process of asking ourselves the right kind of questions. Ethos. What is my right to be heard on this issue? 
Why would the person I'm speaking to care to hear me on this subject? Can I answer that question? Do I have a good answer for that question? If I don't, do I need to find that ethos from somewhere else, from some uh, testimony, some reference that I'm obtaining from somebody else, some fact, some statistic? Logos. What are my reasons for being right? Not only why should I be heard, but why am I right on this issue? And I guess, in a way, quite importantly also, why am I wrong on that issue? Or why am I not wrong, I should say? What, what might somebody say against me? And then pathos. Is it, why does it matter? Why, if they listen to me and they agree with me on the reasons, why should they nonetheless take steps to act, to find in my favour, yeah? that, that matter to them? And you see that by answering those three questions, those three issues, ethos, logos and pathos, although they're very simplistic in and of themselves, they immediately lead to a cascade of questions that becomes very fruitful for us when we're trying to persuade other people. And indeed, from my perspective, ethos, pathos and logos is a, a, a multivariate tool. Because uh, imagine that we are for a moment, as many of you I know in the room are, uh, writers of fiction of some form or another. And we have a scene, a, 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 a piece of a drama perhaps, or indeed even in a novel, a moment of tension. Because as we know, the tension in drama comes from conflict, comes from, as it were, one person wanting one thing and another person uh, needing to be persuaded, if I may put it that way, to give them that thing or to overcome that obstacle. Now, if we begin by asking of each character in the scene, what is the ethos that this character thinks they have? What is the logos? What is the reason that they're going to want this thing or to try and uh, uh, obtain this thing or to deploy with the other person? What is the pathos? What is the emotional uh, import, the reason why it matters to them? We have created a kind of framework, again, for asking useful questions about the uh, process of, of writing fiction. Starting points, of course, but useful ones. Now, more than that, we can use this, for example, in a play to draw out... Uh, questions of character. And uh, again, time being so pressing, I don't, I don't have the opportunity to go into it in the level of detail I would like. You'll have to buy my book, Rhetoric uh, and Shakespeare in Performance, when it comes out later in the year. But because we are told that the first part of the speech, the exordium, is the part where, among other things, you set out your ethos, your right to be heard, which of course makes sense, doesn't it? Because if they're not listening to you, it doesn't matter whether or not you've given them the right reasons and told them why it matters. You have to capture their attention with your right to be heard. If you know that, then you can use that as a tool to see what a character identifies as their ethos. Now, you should have in front of you um, some example sheets. If they're not in front of you, I've, that's because I made people stick them under the chairs at the end of the row. And if uh, you haven't got one, could I ask the people at the end of the row just to look and see if they've got a spare copy and pass it along? Does everyone have a copy? If, you, if, you, if I've got a spare, 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 spare. Oh, look here. Thank you, sir. That's very kind of you. Everyone got one? So if we look here, just briefly, we see, we see the exordium from Othello's speech in the uh, play Othello, where he has been brought before the senators of Venice. And the charge that has brought him before the senators of Venice is that he has married Desdemona, and he has used witchcraft to do so. And here he is defending himself. And in this first part of the speech, uh, the exordium, we would expect, because it's a kind of classical rhetorical scene, that he would follow the dictates of classical rhetoric, and indeed he does. And if we look down, we see some uh, very fascinating things that he does. Just cast your eyes over it very quickly. It runs across uh, the top um, half of the page. If you just read over to the, the three ellipses, and when you get to the end of it, uh, show me that you've got to the end of it by looking up and staring deeply into my eyes. We're going to edit this bit out of the video. <laughs> Yeah. Do, do, um, do you sort of skim read it? People are probably quite familiar with it, I'm going to assume. Um, what's the very first thing that he does? 
Indeed. Most potent, grave and reverend seigneurs, my very noble and approved good masters. Thomas Wilson, who wrote The Art of Rhetoric, probably the first English language uh, textbook on rhetoric in a, uh, first edition 1560. Uh, Shakespeare absolutely had read it. We see references to it directly in his plays. He tells us that the first thing you should do is propitiate the judges. Mm -hmm. Let them know that you're on their side. But it's significant that, that he does so. Because, don't forget, Othello is the outsider. He's not a member of Venetian society. He had choices. He had options. He could have told them, uh, forget it. I'm not playing your game. I'm out. I'm out here with my army. But he doesn't choose to do that. Instead, he chooses to accept their status. He chooses to participate in their game. Indeed, he acknowledges them as his masters. Now, it seems to me that that is potentially the beginning of something significant about this character. Yeah? What does he go on to do after that? Admit his, guilt. Admit his guilt, indeed, indeed. He says that I have taken away this old man's daughter. It is most true, true, I have married her. The very head and front of my offending hath this extent no more. This is called identifying the status of the case. Cicero talks in terms of ansit, quitsit, quale sit. Did the thing happen? What is the definition of the thing? What is the quality of the thing? And so what we're asking there is, did Brutus kill Caesar? Yes, he did. It happened. Does it meet the legal definition of murder? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But was it nonetheless the right thing to do for Rome? Quale sit, the quality of the thing. There is where the argument lies. And the reason Cicero tells us that we must, at the front, identify the status of the case is the reason we were discussing right at the beginning. Because you need to tell people where you're going. They will get lost otherwise. This is uh, an arena, a, a form of communication where people are easily lost. So identify what you're going to talk about. What does he do after that? Humble, self-deprecate. Indeed, absolutely. But he does it in the opportunity of boasting. Yes, rude am I in my speech, and little blessed with the soft phrase of peace. For since these arms of mine had seven years pith, till now some nine moons wasted, they have used their dearest action in the tented field. Rhetorica ad Herenium, which was a, a rhetorical manual written in about uh, uh, 73 BC uh, and for many years attributed wrongly to uh, Cicero, tells us that if at the very beginning you should get the goodwill of the judges by telling them what a good person you are, but you should do it in a way that makes it clear you're not arrogant. <laughs> and so we see uh, Othello doing it. But again, note that what he does is also take the opportunity to remind them this is a choice I'm making. I'm not the best at oratory. I'm the best at killing people. And if you don't like what I'm saying here today, my other option is to go back to my army and come back here and do the thing that I'm extraordinarily good at doing. <laughs> yeah? So first of all, it's kind of bold, isn't it? It's kind of bolshy. It's a bit sort of, ha hi guys, I'm here, but I didn't need to be. That's quite an arrogant character. That's quite a bold character, a confident character. And yet, at the same time, one who wants so much to be part of this society that he gives up one of his advantages in return for them acknowledging that he is also part of that society. Now, of course, that's my interpretation of this. There is no right answer to Shakespeare. What there is, however, is in these sorts of discussions, an analysis of why you would be putting these forward as the matters of ethos that you rely upon in this scenario, and what that might tell an actor about that character and those choices that that character is making that are grounded in the text. I don't need to go out there and go, actually, I've decided Othello is like um, a 16-year-old boy uh, on a sink estate in Manchester, and I'm going to play it like that. You, you have your answer to who the character is in the words that the playwright chose. And we have a tool in ethos, pathos and logos for analysing that. For example, we can ask if an argument is being presented, why has the character moved from ethos to pathos? Now, the answer may be that they see in the person they're trying to persuade that the argument of ethos has not landed and they need to change it to pathos. But either way, the director and the actor is given in that moment an inflection point, an opportunity to change and to make the scene more dynamic because they have in the words, in the course of the argument, something that they can uh, uh, pick up on and run with. Do, do you see that? Um, the last thing, of course, that uh, Othello does is uh, he offers us uh, a round, unvarnished tale. My whole course of love, what drugs, what charms, what conjuration and what mighty magic. 
sex, drugs and rock and roll is what he's going to tell us about. And, of course, that is the other aspect of uh, ethos, your right to be heard, that you will be entertaining. Uh, Cicero says that the orator has three tasks. Docere, delectare, movare. To teach, to delight and to move. And here we have a fellow remembering uh, that it is important to delight. Now, after the three ellipses, we see the peroration. And the peroration is the bit where you sum up very briefly your argument and give it an emotional kick. And this is one of the finest perorations uh, that has ever been written. Upon this hint I spake, she loved me for the dangers I had passed, and I loved her that she did pity them. This only is the witchcraft I have used. Now, uh, in that, of course, we see astonishing amounts of uh, skill uh, with language and rhetorical tricks and techniques and figures. And I see I've left myself precisely ten minutes to give you all of Shakespeare's gold. So buckle up, people. It's going to be a quick ride. Uh, the key thing that I want to introduce you to is the idea that those rhetorical tricks and techniques are not about, or not simply about, gilding the lily, about making the words sound beautiful. They are intended to do something more than that, to convey an emotional and a cognitive state. Can I ask you, if I may, to look over the page to an example from President Obama, in the middle of the page. <coughs> uh, and if, as before with Othello, if you could just cast your eye over that uh, uh, quickly, and uh, when you've got to the end of those three paragraphs, just uh, look up and show me that you have done by staring deeply into my eyes. Quick reader. Excellent. Yes? More or less, everyone's there? OK, look. Look at that first paragraph. Tonight we gather to affirm the great... Do you see that um, sentence there? Just tell me if anyone spots anything in it that is, in your view, slightly grammatically unusual. Not wrong, but just grammatically unusual. Double negatives. Double negatives. I don't think there's a double negative there, is there? There is a negative, not because of. That's absolutely right. That is a technique called litotes. Sorry, possibly not double negative, but the negativity towards the positivity. Yes, indeed, indeed, absolutely right. You've absolutely picked up on the right thing, not because of. That is, as I say, litotes, which I always think of as the English gentleman's rhetorical technique. Mm -hmm. Because if you ask a, an English gentleman, how are you today, sir? Not bad when really they mean to say good, yeah? So it's affirming something by actually denying something else, yeah? Uh, and uh, you, you picked up on that very, very correctly. It wouldn't, I would say, be grammatically unusual. I want to talk about it, but, but I'm looking for something that's a bit, a bit grammatically unusual. No? Any thoughts? Is there a verb missing? Um, I don't think there's a verb missing, because we're gathering, aren't we? We're gathering to affirm. Indeed, I guess we're also affirming. <laughs> um, I don't, but no, I don't, it's not that that I'm looking for, at any rate. Oh, kind of stops. Go on. Where he, he kind of lifts it up with the not because of this or this or this. Yes. Like now, you've, you, you've picked up on the, the thing, but what is it that, that's causing that effect? The ors? Yes, absolutely right. You, you had it too, sir. That, uh, that is a technique called polysyndeton. And uh, it is where you have a multiplicity of conjunctions. Conjunction being a joining word, and, or, but. I'm looking out at members of the London Library and explaining to them about conjunctions. I'll get over myself in a minute. Um, and what, what's fascinating about it is that it isn't wrong, right? But it is unusual, because normally if you're saying, as here, a list of three things, you say A, B, or C. But here, President Obama, or as he was then, Senator Obama, has said A or B or C. And in a way, your answer has picked up on why he's done it. That additional conjunction hasn't changed the grammar of the sentence, hasn't changed the fundamental meaning of the sentence, and yet it has successfully conveyed something new. Now, to fully appreciate that, I need to treat you a little bit like the Vienna Boys Choir, uh, by asking you to repeat after me. Yes, that could have gone a very dark way, couldn't it? Um, <laughs> we'll also edit that bit out of the video. Um, 
not because of the height of our skyscraper. Let's read that all together, following along after me. From, we'll go from tonight. But the first time we read it through, let's drop that first or. So, tonight, come on, guys, we've got to, you've got to follow along with me. Tonight, we gather to affirm the greatness of our nation. Not, not because of the height of our skyscrapers, the power of our military, or the size of our economy. Okay, let's do it again, but it's this time, put the or back in. Tonight, we gather to affirm the greatness of our nation, not because of the height of our skyscrapers, or the power of our military, or the size of our economy. Do you hear the difference? Yes? Immediately, the rhythm has been changed. And in changing that rhythm, we have also managed to convey something of the strength, of the power, but also, I think, crucially, your point. Combined with the Latotes, the effect of the sentence is to imply he stopped, not because he reached a complete list, A, B, or C, that's it, kids. He could have gone on. It could have been A, or B, or C, or D, or E. He's got to stop somewhere to give you the impression that America has a vast array of things, and yet at the same time to say, but if it isn't any of those, what can it be? To create a sense of anticipation. Do, do you see that? Did you hear it, more importantly? Did you feel it when we spoke it out loud? And do you see that that rhetorical technique of polysyndeton is not a change in the words, in the sense that new words of different meaning have been introduced. Yes, it's not a change in the fundamental meaning of that sentence. It is nonetheless a change that has conveyed something emotional and cognitive to the listener about what President Obama is trying to say. Yes? That, do, do you understand at least my argument, even if you don't agree with it? Yeah? Now, if we move on, to the um, uh, final paragraph, that is the true genius of America. Do you see again something grammatically unusual? That, that, that. Uh, yeah, that, well, that's actually, um, ju just go up to the uh, semicolon, you're right. The that, 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 that is very important. That is uh, anaphora, which is where you repeat uh, a phrase at the beginning of uh, e each section. I have a dream, I have a dream, I have a dream. That is anaphora, but that's not what I'm looking for. Look just up to the um, semicolon after miracles. Do, do you see anything? A repetition of a faith, absolutely. That is the true genius of America, a faith, a faith. Now that is a technique called diocopy. I should pause here, by the way, to say that I once gave a lecture on rhetoric to the Centre for Oratory and Rhetoric at the University of London bunch of very serious academics on rhetoric. And it became clear to me as I pronounced all of these uh, rhetorical terms that they were visibly wincing as I did so. <laughs> so please, I don't for one moment pretend that I either name them correctly or pronounce those names correctly. And indeed, that doesn't matter at all. Uh, indeed, I take that from the highest authority. Quintilian tells us it doesn't matter what they're called at all. The judge of rhetorical technique is, an, is the ear, and the only judge is the ear. Nonetheless, I'm going to call it diocopy. Why is the diocopy there? It's more like you're just talking rather than it's something written. It's the okay. way you speak. Oh, indeed. Why? Why is that? Um, because you, you would, if you were writing it, you would cross out the second page. It's In, like indeed. You're thinking as you're going along. In, indeed, we can we can hear it again, can't we? If I, look, uh, let me take your suggestion. That is the true genius of America: a faith in simple dreams and an insistence on small miracles. Now I'll do it again, as I imagine President Obama did it. That is the true genius of America, a faith. Yes, a faith. <laughs> and simple dreams and insistence on small miracles. Okay, I exaggerate. But do you see that by giving himself that diocopy, that, that moment of repetition, it's as if he has caught himself on his own idea. And of course, that is what gives him the impression of spontaneity, as if he is thinking of these things himself for the very first time, as if he had not previously considered the true genius of America, which was that it is a faith. <laughs> My God, that's brilliant. A faith, yes? And we know that that's what he's aiming for, because we then see that he uses the opposite of polysyndeton, he uses asyndeton, because there should be a conjunction between the two instances, simple dreams and small miracles. But he's taken it out. Why? Because he doesn't have time for your conjunctions. He's excited to tell you about the faith, the genius of America, faith in small dreams and insistence on small miracles. Do, do you see? And again, nothing has been changed, no words have been um, uh, altered here in order to alter the meaning. And yet the meaning has been fundamentally altered. We have something new being conveyed, being conveyed by rhythm, by tone, by stress. Now, of course, it, we all understand that that's how language can work from poetry. But sometimes we forget that all of those factors are available to us in prose. And yet here we see, 
In this example, used by one of the most famous modern orators, this is not a thing of 2,000 years ago, this is a thing of 2004, exactly those techniques being used. And of course, if we turn over the page, we see, we see at least two um, examples of rhetorical techniques. So first we have a technique called paralipsis. And here in uh, my uh, note, what I've given to you is um, the explanation of it taken from the book uh, Rhetorica ad Herenium, and then a Ciceronian example. So uh, uh, pro probably the best one um, being uh, the, the first one from um, uh, Cicero's defence, sorry, prosecution speech against Verres, and to say nothing of the stains and disgraces of his youth. You get to mention the stains and disgraces of his youth, but you don't have to discuss the detail of them, yeah? Which is indeed what uh, we're told in the Rhetorica ad Herenium is the purpose of it, uh, employed in a matter which is not pertinent to call specifically to the attention of others, uh, but better uh, to do so um, greater advantage by suspicion by paralipsis than to insist directly on a statement that is refutable. Now, Shakespeare does exactly the same, of course. Mark Antony, speaking of Caesar's will to the mob, have patience, gentle friends, I must not read it. It is not meet you know how Caesar loved you, yeah? So he gets to tell you, oh, Caesar loved you, by saying, I'm not gonna do that. I'd never do that, yeah? That speech, these speeches, absolutely fascinating. Again, I wish there was more time to discuss it because that is one of the examples of where the guidance of Thomas Wilson in the art of rhetoric is lifted basically verbatim and applied to Brutus and Mark Antony in those speeches. But our focus must be on the great President Trump, uh, who uh, has proceeded to make paralipsis his own rhetorical technique to, to really, I think, lift it, if we may say so, to the very heights, the apogee uh, to which it may be uh, thought of. So first we have his, his rival presidential candidate, Carly Fiorina. I promised I would not say she ran Hewlett-Packard into the ground, that she laid off 10,000s of people and she got viciously fired. I said I'll not say it, so I will not say it. Or of journalist Megyn Kelly, I refuse to call her a bimbo because that would not be politically correct. <laughs> or indeed of Kim Jong-un, why would Kim Jong-un insult me by calling me old when I would never call him short and fat? <laughs> um, over the page we have a discussion of amplification. Amplification apparently the most important of the rhetorical uh, techniques, although it can be achieved in a number of different ways. Thomas Wilson um, tells us uh, uh, of some of them, and he explains that vehemence of language helps the matter forwards better when more is gathered by thinking than if the things <coughs> spoken of had been set in plain words, as when we say a woman spits fire and we understand immediately that she is a devil. Uh, Thomas Wilson uh, probably having not gone to his diversity training uh, <laughs> at the time that he wrote this. But indeed, we see Trump very much leaning into that sort of thing of Hillary Clinton, crooked Hillary Clinton, the worst and biggest loser of all time. Now, the genius of that, of course, is, and indeed my other favorite, Marco Rubio. The problem with Marco is he's a choke artist. He chokes, we can't have a choke artist. You know, one thing I learned from the sports, I was actually a very good athlete. <laughs> when you're a choker, you're always a choker. Now, what I think is very brilliant about that and about the whole crooked Hillary Clinton thing is, this is a sort of example of what in modern times we would call seeing past the sale. So what that means is when you, you go to buy the car and the salesman goes, would you like it in red or in yellow? Yeah, so the implication there is you've, you're gonna buy it. Now you only need to think about whether it's a red car or a yellow car and kind of mentally they've anchored you a bit further on than you meant to be. And Trump is a great master of that. So we take the, um, uh, uh, the problem with Marco is he's a choke artist. And we ask ourselves, okay, well, I know what a choker is. Well, I know what it is to choke, but to be a choke artist. <laughs> and then you can't help but ask yourself, well, I mean, Marco Rubio, is he, is he good enough to be an artist at choking? <laughs> and of course, you know, uh, some people go, well, of course he's not good enough to be an artist at choking. No, but I mean, to be an artist at choking, you'd have to do it on a regular basis. And then people are going, well, how many times is regular? Is it like every time he appears or just once or twice? And now all we're doing is discussing the degree to which Marco Rubio is a choker. Yeah, rather than actually going, <laughs> what? Why are we, please, this is the level of debate. That is the genius of it. Similarly, um, we have with crooked Hillary Clinton, that's a complete, what, what does it mean crooked? It's a completely meaningless, it's an unframed allegation. 
But because it's unframed, it becomes in the minds of the audience absolutely anything they want it to, as in uh, the explanation from Thomas Wilson, uh, more is gathered by thinking than if the thing had been set in plain words. Indeed, when we say a woman spits fire, we understand immediately she is a devil. When we say crooked Hillary Clinton, we understand immediately Benghazi, the email server, etc., etc. That's the genius, but he never has to say anything. And then he goes on to say, Clinton is the worst and biggest loser of all time. Again, what? By what standard? By what test? But it doesn't matter. The anchor has been placed well down the road. One of the great things about uh, Trump was when he said he was a, a multi-billionaire. People go, no, he's not a multi-billionaire. He's got at the most one billion. You go, You're just talking about how many billions he's got now. That's genius rhetoric. Now, of course, many of you were saying, but he, he doesn't move me at all. He doesn't touch me. His arguments I am immune to. And that, my friends, is because you are not his target audience. And the reason, one of the reasons that, like it or not, President Trump is very good at rhetoric is that he targets his message at the people he is trying to persuade. And that is one of the lessons that I hope that you have taken away uh, from this last hour. And in that hour, I hope I have given you ethos, pathos and logos, an understanding of the great scope uh, of rhetoric's understanding of language, some insight into the rhetorical techniques, and also a strong hunger for a cheese sandwich <laughs> and an avocado smash with a poached egg. My friends, thank you. Thank you. Now, I did my very level best to try and talk out the time that was available for questions. If a particularly difficult one is asked for me, I intend to ruthlessly patronise you in an attempt to frighten off any others. But if anybody has got any questions they would like to ask me now, please, please do. I think you put your hand up first. I, uh, if I grab this gen ladies, not gentleman, lady here with the microphone. Um, yes. Yes, Mr. Brown, is that one thing you have touched on, yes. which is obviously <laughs> to Shakespeare as a dramatist was extremely important. You haven't actually mentioned timing. Timing? Oh, no. Uh, in what sense? In performative timing? Yes. Yes. That, my friend, the list of things that I haven't mentioned is vast. And I'm afraid the timing issue really was my hour. Uh, <laughs> The performance, but you're right, timing is uh, very important. And indeed, uh, I know more about that, actually, from performing as a comedian than I do uh, directly from uh, rhetoric. Uh, much of what rhetoric has to say about performance and timing is uh, drawn from what actors have to offer. And Cicero uh, explains that if you want to learn about it, you should go and study with an actor. He uh, did precisely that, uh, as did um, Quintilian, as did others. Uh, but he also refers to uh, acting as the inconsequential art of the actor. For who has been to see an actor but not come away feeling despondent at the way that they speak without meaning? Because although uh, he accepted that they were the masters of performance, he thought they were as nothing next to orators because they didn't understand the power of ideas and cloaking them in the right language. Uh, by my book, big section on timing. <laughs> um, uh, madam, you asked. Oh, hang on, sorry. Just... No, no, excuse me. Yes. I absolutely thought it was a marvellous talk. That's very kind Thank of you. Thank you very much, but very... I have a train to come. Oh, quite right, quite right. I'm sorry I must go. No, no, it's very kind it of you. It's fantastic. You're very kind to come, and indeed to stay to such a point. Um, your question. You talked about ethos, pathos and logos. Yes. Where does the persuasion through fear come in? Because that is... Quite powerful. I mean, yeah. I'm thinking of the Iraq War. Yes. We all were told we could have blown up in 45 minutes. Yes. And Yes, well, I, mean, I think the answer to that is that that is an aspect of pathos, isn't it? That's telling you why uh, these arguments as to whether or not they do or don't have weapons of mass destruction matter. Why we need to act, indeed, I would say, for many people, the concern was why we need to act with such immediate haste without uh, taking opportunity for more time. And of course, fear uh, drives out careful thought. 
uh, and that is one of the reasons why uh, it is such a powerful technique. I mean, uh, one of the things I think is interesting is Aristotle says right at the beginning of the art of rhetoric, uh, people criticise rhetoric because it can be used to persuade you to do uh, terrible things. But that is true of any skill, he says, and really that's not a reason not to study rhetoric. Indeed, uh, it is a shame not to teach our children to understand how rhetoric works and thus to arm them uh, with it uh, when we consider it a shame not to teach them how uh, to war. Uh, so that, that's always been the view I take. Uh, I think there's a lady behind you. Um, I was going to ask, on the fact of uh, on, um, performance, Yes. quite frequently it is always done in number threes. Yes. So you've got labels, 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 but I want this, I want this, I want this. Why yeah. is it that human beings, from your experience and uh, understanding, that three is the right number? Um, I, I can't explain to you what it is within the neuroscience of it that means that three is the magic number. I know that the reason that it works is because it is the first occasion where we have a, a, what appears to be a complete list of things. So it's the first moment at which you think, oh, this is a, a, a set, I know that I've got a set. And it's why Ace and Deaton, Policy and Deaton can be so powerful, because so conscious are we of this idea, we've got the complete set, that if you frame it in the way that says, and now the set is over, A, B or C, then people understand that that's the end of uh, the matter uh, in particular, whereas if you go A or B or C, they don't know how big the set is, and that in that way you can um, carry on with it. Uh, another reason for it, and for a lot of rhetorical techniques, is that they give the false impression that there's some form of logic at work. So you talked about threes, but there are particular kinds of threes, and one of them is the tricolon, which is where you have three passages of, of equal length. And the, the the reason why that's so powerful as a technique, apart from it being a list of three things, is that the apparent equality of the length of the elements seems to suggest that they were meant to be like that, that there's some kind of deeper logic at work. And indeed, it's often called out for for that purpose. Veni, vidi, vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. Yes, that is a tricolon, and it implies, as Caesar intended it to imply, that the conquering was inevitable. Yeah. Uh, lady at the back there, I think or indeed either lady. I think probably those are going to be the last two, I suspect, by time, sadly, although I'm very happy to answer questions at the, as you buy my book. Um, how often do you use those techniques in everyday life? Well, I mean, my job is as a... What your job? Oh. A British Telecom call centre, getting covered <laughs> off the headline, something like that. Well, well funnily enough, I, I, I mean, I, I don't... I, I wouldn't say that I pause to frame my complaint to BT in the form of chiasmus or anything <laughs> along those lines. But I do try to take my own advice about thinking about what the constraints are on the, on the other person, rather than... I mean, the BT call centre is a classic example. The temptation is very strongly to pick up the phone and let them know how very angry you are. But to them, that's a matter of complete irrelevance. What you need to do is to frame it in terms of what their available powers are and what they... Why am I doing the phone gesture? <laughs> <laughs> and what they can do for you. And so uh, th that is always, when I'm talking to BT Call Centre, what I'm trying, maybe ineptly, to do. To, to say, look, what, what available steps are you able to take? Because if you take these steps, y you'll get a satisfied customer and I'll be very happy, rather than... Argh! Although, of course, naturally, the temptation is to do exactly that. <coughs> um, I think there was a lady over there. Um, yeah, I just wondered, most of the sort of things we've been speaking about, um, with, with speaking, um, yes. talking, conversation, yes. you have the sort of, you, know, you can see how someone's reacting, you can use body language and your voice. Um, do you think about it differently with writing, where really if someone's just reading something, it's maybe a slightly different... Uh, well, I, I think there are obviously different factors at play. So, for example, one of the differences is that, is that in writing, uh, the person reading it has the opportunity to go back and review what's been said before, and so that you don't need to repeat yourself to the same degree uh, as you would have to do in uh, this kind of speaking, because that structural difference is, is there. But nonetheless, I think uh, it, it proves to be a very fruitful consideration rhetoric for the purposes of writing, because in most cases you can imagine that the person is actually, if you like, reading it out loud in their mind and hearing exactly the sorts of things that you would want them to be hearing. But perhaps more importantly, all the issues of invention 
the arguments you're coming up with, the way that you're framing them, the prompts for thoughts, all the questions of disposition, those are all absolutely still there. Consider ethos and the need to put that up front. You still want someone to work their way through your thesis. If you haven't gripped them at the front and told them why they should do so, you, you're going to have lost them. That's a, that's a question of communication that transfers across all three. Oh, sorry, I, I'm, all, all manners of communication. And interestingly, Cicero in um, Brutus uh, says uh, that the best way to get better as an orator is by writing speeches, because that is the vast majority of the work of rhetoric is in invention and in disposition and in uh, style, elocutio. Performance is important, but it comes right at the very end. It's very weird. All of them agree with Demosthenes that the important thing is delivery, 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 and then they never talk about it. Because at the end of the day, it's acting. The difficult part is the first part. Um, could I do the last question? Oh, yes. Do you think all of this comes down in the end to storytelling? If you're not telling a story, all the rhetorical devices don't work. Well, I, I mean, I think a story is a very powerful tool for getting people to follow along with you because you're w wanting to engage them in a journey and the beginning, middle and end of a story is part of that journey. A lot of rhetorical techniques are about creating a level of active involvement that is otherwise missing. That's why we use rhetorical questions because rhetorical questions turn a passive audience, non-conversationalist, sitting back just admiring uh, the fluidity and the uh, verbosity of my words, into people who think, oh my god, he's, he's just asked me a question and, and he might actually want an answer, or indeed prompting them to think, oh, maybe that is something I need to deal with, which of course we know from advertising works, because at the end of the TV programme, uh, before the break, you get a little question and they promise you the answer only when you come back after the advert break. Now, the reason they do that is because if you go to people, there's a problem, people don't leave at that point. They go, well, well, well what is it? What, what, what is the problem? Tell, what's the answer? And rhetorical question is, is about that. And I think story is about that as well. There was a guy, and you won't believe what happened to him. He lost his leg. Let me tell you how. And do you see what I'm saying? You know, that's, that's prolepsis. Here's the problem. You, you're going to want to find out how he got into that situation. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So I agree with you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't reduce rhetoric to storytelling. But no, it's... No. Story, storytelling is much bigger than rhetoric. Ah. I wouldn't say it was just... I would disagree with you there. I would say that rhetoric is about language and how language works on the minds of others. And therefore, storytelling is within rhetoric. Uh, poetic. Uh, Aristotle's discussion of, of um, poetic, I would say is within rhetoric, um, although we can have that debate uh, as you get my book to be signed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much.